welcome you all to this Distinguished Speaker Series uh, webinar. We are excited and delighted that you all could join us. My name is Prashant Joshi. I'm here uh, as one of the servants uh, and, uh, of, of Wayu, and we are so uh, blessed and delighted to have uh, our distinguished speaker today, Raja Chaudhary ji. Uh, he's joining us from Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, without, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our distinguished speaker. But again, welcome to Vivekananda Yoga University, the first yoga university outside India doing graduate education and research. So we are so glad that you could join us. I'm so delighted on behalf of Vayu to introduce our distinguished speaker, uh, Raja Chaudhary ji, who's a writer, producer, and director of a new documentary coming out with America's first guru. The first major documentary on Swami Vivekananda, Vedanta, and Yoga on US public television, and first by an Indian director, mind you. Uh, so Rajaji trained as an architect in London, but he decided to go into media, filmmaking, and spiritual storytelling. So what we have today is a master storyteller uh, who's gonna talk about uh, give, giving us deep insights into Swami Vivekananda who brought yoga to the West. And again, we are so happy and, and really delighted and honored to uh, uh, you know, have him here. Uh, his accolades go back and he's a national Film Award winner from a, a film called Quantum Indians. Uh, and again, uh, on the International Day of Yoga, he actually uh, directed a film called Yoga Harmony with Nature for the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, celebrating the first International Day of Yoga. And um, he uh, is initiated into the Ramakrishna Mission, uh, the disciple of uh, you know, Amruta Nandaji, and he's uh, known as a spiritual uh, teacher, uh, Sri Vidya and Kriya Yoga uh, uh, teacher. And um, really, really, again, many, many accolades that uh, I would uh, have him uh, uh, say more things as we go along. And he lives in Princeton, New Jersey, with his wife, daughter, and a dog by the name of Max. So with that, uh, Rajaji, the floor is yours. Again, thank you for being here. And uh, it's an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you. In the, in the Swamiji's favorite uh, prayer from the Upanishads. We can invoke it now, if you don't mind. Asato ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mrityor ma amritam gamaya. Om shanti, shanti, shanti. Heavenly Mother, take us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, and from death to immortality. Om Peace, peace, peace. Greetings, everybody, and welcome. And I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. Um, as uh, Prashanji said, we are releasing a new film on Swami Vivekananda on American television, public television, and also on the PBS app. So if you're in the United States, you'll be able to watch it on PBS stations and on the app. And it is coming out on 27th April. And it will be on for the next few years on public television. We'll also make it available on Prime Video. But it's the first time, and this is a very important point, it's the first time that a story on Swami Vivekananda or any great Indian mystical teacher, spiritual teacher, has been shown on public television in a positive way, and that too by an Indian producer-director. So... This, I'm very honored to be the first to take on this legacy, and I hope that it opens the door for many other filmmakers to do lots of wonderful things on Indian stories and Indian American and yoga stories and spirituality stories. And what I'll do is I want you to just join me for a few minutes while we see the teaser trailer of the film. It's about five minutes long. So please indulge me and let us watch it together. All right, so I will just share the screen and more than a hundred years ago, America welcomed a son of India, Swami. Vivekananda. And Swami Vivekananda helped bring Hinduism and yoga to our country. And he came to my hometown of Chicago. And there, at a 
great gathering of religious leaders. He spoke of his faith and the divinity in every soul and the purity of love. And he began his speech with a simple greeting. Sisters, Sisters and, and brothers, brothers of, of America. America. Sectarianism, bigotry, and its horrible descendant, fanaticism, have long possessed this beautiful earth. But their time has come, and I fervently hope that the bell that tolled this morning in honor of this convention may be the death knell of all fanaticism, of all persecutions with the sword or with the pen, In 1893, America celebrated its golden age. The World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago was designed to celebrate America's new status as a global superpower. The exhibition was also host to the world's first Parliament of Religions. At the same time, a young, unknown monk in India was getting ready, ready to initiate a revolution that would transform America a revolution for the American soul. I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of monks in the world. I thank you in the name of the mother of all religions. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. They got a surprise. They did not count on him stealing the show. I always call him the Jackie Robinson of the uh, penetration of Indian spirituality into America. And he comes in his orange turban and his scarlet suit, and he says, we are not servile. We have a religion that is equal, if not better, to yours, because we are tolerant, we are open-minded, we are diverse. Not just the East and the West, the past and the future met at that point. A modern world was born, history culminated to bring that point about, and from that point again, it radiates out into the future. My ideal indeed can be put into a few words, and that is to preach unto mankind their divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. How does a guy show up in the West and becomes an absolute rock star? you know, dazzles the likes of J.D. Rockefeller, William James, Nikola Tesla, Emma Calvay, the superstar opera singer, Sarah Bernhardt, the greatest actress of her time, to becoming almost forgotten. This is the man who introduced the concepts of yoga and meditation to the West. He establishes the first Vedanta Society in New York in 1894, and the Vedanta Society attracts, in addition to ordinary folks, some really incredibly talented artists and intellectuals and thinkers, people like Christopher Isherwood, Aldous Huxley, in succeeding generations, Houston Smith, J.D. Salinger, Joseph Campbell. Just think about more than a hundred years ago, he's talking about the harmony of religions, when we're not at all in fashion to talk about that. I think that the future of spirituality is what might be called spiritual cosmopolitanism. Be open and receptive to all the different spiritual traditions in the world, try to learn from the different spiritual traditions. No one had ever heard such ideas on a public stage in America. Swami Vivekananda taught Americans that everyone had a spark of divinity. He taught them that all religions were true because they all led to the same ultimate truth. He showed us that there was a divine spark within each of us, and it was a reflection of that very consciousness from which the whole universe arose. He changed the way Americans saw themselves, and the way the world saw India forever. This is the story of America's first guru. Uh... Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that little teaser. And the theme of the film and what I want to talk to you about today is what was the message that Swami Vivekananda was bringing to the world? You know, 
So for that, we have to go back a little bit and understand that we are a culture that is ancient, yet at the same time, it is the most vibrant and evolving psychology and culture the world has seen because we have had a continuous civilization of dialogue and discussion and thinking on mystical spiritual matters for thousands of years. You know, you know, the one constants we have had, if we look at it carefully, are the ideas of yoga, the ideas of the Upanishads, the ideas of Vedanta. And if we look at this carefully, think about what it must have been like in 1860s Calcutta when young Narendra was born. You know, this was a young man who was born into a lawyer's family. His father, Vishwanath, was a lawyer. And, and the Calcutta High Court, that means an English-speaking gentleman working with the British. And he was a High Court judge. Now, and a lawyer. And so Narendra was brought up to be an English gentleman. He was going to be a lawyer. He was going to, he went to Scottish church school. He went to all these kind of things. He was being prepared. He became a Freemason. He was being prepared at that time, like Lord Macaulay says, to prepare Indians to serve their masters by thinking like Englishmen, by being Englishmen, and almost hating their own culture, you know. That was a major part of the thinking at that time. So when Narendra came into this world, he was very drawn mystically to other things. He wanted to ask about God. He was asking everybody, have you seen God? Have you talked about God? And he was very mystical because his mother had a strong bhakti yoga tradition in the house, right? And what we see is that his mother was the driving force of his bhakti, his devotion, his mysticism. His father was his pragmatic, practical, you know, what are you going to be? May be a good man, be a good person. And um, so the whole key was that if he could find a balance, he was always looking for the balance. And even before he met Sri Ramakrishna, because he only met Sri Ramakrishna when he was 17, he was already having mystical experiences. He was practicing yoga. He was doing all kinds of things. And the young man, Noren, was uh, quite a character because he was a wrestler. He was a singer. He was a polymath. He could do many things. He, could, he studied Western philosophy. He studied Sanskrit. He was well-versed in many, many things. He could speak many languages. He was quite a young man. And in fact, William Hastings, his uh, teacher, said that this is a genius, you know. But then he had joined the Brahmo Samaj. And the Brahmo Samaj was an organization set up by Raja Ram Mohan Roy that was being run by a man called Keshav Chandra Sen in Calcutta at that time, who believed in the synthesis of East and West, who were trying to revive the Vedic Vedas and the traditions of yoga to the world. And they wanted acceptance from the British that these were legitimate ways of being in the modern world. So then they had rejected idolatry and bhakti traditions, but they had cultivated Vedic and Vedic ideals, and they were very enigmatic, liberal in their thinking. He grew up in that world. But then he met Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna came to an evening in Calcutta and met him. And in that evening, Sri Ramakrishna went into ecstasy and samadhi in seeing him. Now, Ramakrishna was an illiterate monk, a uh, priest in Dakineshwar, just outside, south of Calcutta. And there he was the temple priest to Makali. To, and, but he had been practicing many, many traditions. He had studied Christianity, Sufism, and most importantly, he had figured out a way to integrate two traditions. One was the kind of Shakti tradition of Makali, or Bhakti and devotion. And the other was the idea of the Advait Vedanta, of the non-dual, the Tatvam Asi idea. And he was the first, I would say, one of the first to integrate these two together. In fact, Swami Medananda, one of the teachers of the Ramakrishna Mission says that 
we call it Vigyana Vedanta. That means a Vedanta that says that, yes, you are divine. The one true divinity, your true nature is, your Atma is that Brahman. But you are also of this world. And in this world, it is determined by Shakti, by energy, by bhakti, by power, by body, by yoga, by all these things. And one can live a perfectly balanced life between the two. This was the great revolution that Ramakrishna gave to Vivekananda and that Vivekananda was able to bring to the world. And one of the things that Vivekananda did, which was remarkable, and he, he first of all, he had this huge experience with, with, uh, with him, with Ramakrishna, and that led to a massive transformation in character. So at 17, you know, we could call it a Shakti path or we could call it a, a transmission, but Ramakrishna touched him with his foot and sent him into an ecstatic state of samadhi that has been described by, in the film, we describe it very clearly what he experienced, the dissolution of the world, the, the wonderful explosion of consciousness. And he was terrified. He was 17 years old. He was terrified. And when he came back, he knew that life would never be the same. He was going to learn to figure this out. And so he spent many years. And when he started studying with Ramakrishna, as with all great adventures, his world fell apart. And slowly, slowly, his father died. They lost their estate. He became, they became poor. The mother was forced to live with other family members and their family moved out. And all this time, he's being pulled towards the mystical life. So in uh, 1886, you know, Sri Ramakrishna suffered deeply from throat cancer, but he had brought together a group of young men led by Noren, and he initiated them into monastic life. This is the birth of what we call the Ramakrishna mission today. And they were taught two things, which is one of the greatest gifts that Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda gave to the world. They, they were teaching Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta. That means the Vedanta of the non-dual self, Advaita Vedanta. And they were teaching yogas to how to achieve those states, particularly the four yogas of the, of the Bhagavad Gita, of the Upanishads, which were Raja Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, and Jnana Yoga. So while most people think of Vedantins as Jnana Yogis, that means those who realize through contemplation, mind, thinking, hearing, reading, you know, what we call Shavana, Manana, and Nididhyasana, these three principles, what they were also teaching was that you could achieve all that through any of the yogas, through breath, through Hatha Yoga, through control of the senses, through um, bhakti, through devotion, through surrender, and then through karma yoga, by doing action in the world. In fact, the um, monks of the Ramakrishna in the film also call it practical Vedanta. That means applied Vedanta. So the key that he discovered, then Ramakrishna, when he died, they became monastics. And Swami Vivekananda, he was known as Swami Satchitananda in the beginning, decided that he would travel around India and look at India. And this was the revelation for him because he had seen the British rule in Calcutta. It was the capital of British India, but he had not understood what India was going through during British time and then before it in Mughal times. He wanted to see it. So he traveled and he was meeting mystics and babas and holy men, but he was also meeting maharajas and kings and all kinds of things. And he traveled. And as he traveled, one of his dearest friends became, uh, you know, the, uh, the Maharaja of Khetri, Ajit Singh. And he traveled everywhere. And when he traveled, wonderful thing happened was that he had many experiences and met amazing people, but he also had this huge realization that India had become a slave nation. That not slave to the British, not slave to the Mughals, but slave to a mental state of weakness. India had become weak. And this 
just devastated him. Because what he said was that India needs strong people. India needs to get up and do something. So he was traveling. He was frustrated with what he was saying. He says, how can I worry about my own awakening when I see people starving and not eating and crushed by poverty all over this country? This was his words. He said this. And when he said that, when he got to Chennai, he, that time it was Madras, when he got to Madras, he met a group of young men and they had talked about this great thing that was coming in Chicago, the Parliament of Religions. So they said, you must go. You must be the representative of India, of Hinduism. So he didn't want to go at first. Then he went to Kanyakumari and he had a massive mystical experience on the rock. He swam out to the rock and had this experience. Then he came back and he saw in his vision, Sri Ramakrishna pointing to the seas and saying, go, go and teach them Vedanta, our Vedanta. Go and teach. Right. So this was this great moment. Right. And when he came back to Madras, they tried to raise money. And a lot of people promised, you know, Maharaja of Ramnath, all these people promised a lot of money, but they were only able to raise about 179 pounds. And that was devastating for the young man because to go to America would minimum would be one pound a day. They had no papers, they had no documentation, nothing. So Ajit Singh of K3 came to help him. And he went to K3 and he changed him to Swami Vivekananda, the name. That's when it happened. He became, uh, the, he put him in that beautiful uh, uh, purple robes and orange uh, turban and gave him that look of a Maharaja, of almost of the spiritual realm. And then he arranged all his papers, got him first class ticket, got him papers, got him letters for Chicago and gave him 300 pounds more. And he had all this ready and then he sent his secretary to Bombay and he put him on a ship and sent him off to Chicago. And that's how it happened. So then he gets to Chicago and he realizes that A, he doesn't have any papers. B, he has enough money just to do a few months and the, and the parliament was three months away from when he arrived at the Colombian exhibition. So he gets there and he's terrified because he thinks, all these dreams I have of raising money here, awakening America, all these things will all fail. I can't even afford to live here. It's cost me one pound a day. So he got very depressed. But then he met this amazing woman on the train called Kate. And Kate became his first mother in America. And if you look at the story of Swami Vivekananda, a series of mother figures came and saved him at every step. And it was the women in America that really organized the Vedanta Society and all of that. So he started, he went off and he, then he, she welcomed him in Boston, gave him a place to live for three months, introduced him to a Harvard professor who gave him letters to go back to the parliament. He got a designation of the Parliament of Religions as an independent monk of India. And he came back and he was able to deliver his speech. So I want to show you that he arrives back at the parliament. There's a scene in the movie where we talk about the speech. And let me show that to you, right? We affectionately invite the representatives of all faiths to aid us in presenting to the world at the exposition of 1893, the religious harmonies and unities of humanity. We are met together today as men, children of one God. We are not here as Baptists and Buddhists, Catholics and Confucians, Parsis and Presbyterians, Methodists and Muslims. We are here as members of a parliament of religions over which flies no sectarian flag. And they're trying to say America is not just about technology and money and capitalism and manufacturers. It's also about the New Jerusalem. When Vivekananda took his seat on the stage, his ochre red robe, yellow turban, bronze complexion and fine features stood out prominently and drew everyone's attention particularly the women. 
He had never addressed such a large assembly, and when he was asked to give his speech, he was seized with terror and requested the chairman call on him a little later. By five o'clock, the giant audience of over 4,000 was tired of all the monotonous speeches, and Vivekananda realized that this was his moment. Sisters and brothers of America. He is electrifying. And he's electrifying in a strange way because he isn't expecting to be electrifying. I mean, he, he addresses people as equals. He calls them brothers and sisters of America. And it's a legend, but it's a legend that has a lot of truth. It fills my heart with joy unspeakable to rise in response to the warm and cordial welcome which you have given us. I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of monks in the world. I thank you in the name of the mother of all religions. And I thank you in the name of the millions and millions of Hindu people of all classes and sects. Before him was the power and dynamism of the modern West at that time. The East and the West met at that point, and not just the East and the West, the past and the future met at that point. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. I am proud to belong to a nation which has sheltered the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all nations on the earth. It is extraordinary because he himself... So, just imagine that what we don't know about this story is that he was such a hit at the parliament that he continued for three more years in America. You know, he, he, he signed up with the Speaker's Bureau. First year, he went around after the parliament because he was such a super hit at the parliament because he was, everybody loved him. They wanted to hear him all the time. The media wrote about him. The New York Herald called him, you know, how can we send missionaries to this country when they can teach us so much about the world? You know, this was the most amazing moment for Indian philosophy on a Western stage, first time, you know. And that was a massive breakthrough. The media loved him, the people, he was invited to dinners every night for the three weeks he was at the parliament. But then after the parliament, he went to stay with this Hale family that looked after his second mother was Mother Hale. And the Hale family prepared him and he joined the Speaker's Bureau and he started doing lectures. And his first lecture in Chicago was in December of that year and was a super hit. But at first, he wasn't talking about Vedanta. He was talking about the customs and traditions of Hinduism in India. That was what people wanted. He thought people wanted to hear that. And he went around the Midwest and Chicago, Boston, all these cities speaking about this. But he realized that what he really wanted to teach was what Ramakrishna taught him on Vedanta. The universalism, the pluralism, the acceptance of all parts as true, the one true divine nature in every human being. This is what he wanted to do. So he got out of his contract with the Speaker's Bureau and he started teaching Vedanta. And that summer, he went to a beautiful retreat in Greenacre and he taught the first time he started teaching yoga classes in America. And he taught yoga at this beautiful retreat called Greenacre, where he taught every day, he would teach Hatha Yoga, he would do meditation, he would teach them to chant Shivoham, Shivoham. He would do all kinds of things with them. And this was a retreat where people had come to listen to music and do spiritual practices and all this. And that made him a superstar. And after that, he went to New York and he, he stood up at the Brooklyn Association and said, I have a message for the East. Religion is true that there is a path to truth. There is a path to freedom. There is a path to this. So I want to play you a couple of clips of what he said. So most importantly, what happened, and I'm going to wind up in a little bit here, but two things happened. One, in that first year when he was speaking and talking, he realized that what Americans needed 
was not pure Advait Vedanta or even just Ramakrishna Vedanta. What they needed was a practical way of having Vedanta in their lives, right? So the basic thing about Vedanta that he knew was that it was about freedom. So let's listen to him talk about freedom a little bit on this, right? The ideal of Vedanta is to know man as he really is. The solution of the Vedanta is that we are not bound. We are free already. Not only so, but to say or to think that we are bound is dangerous. Do not say it, do not think it. This is summed up in the Vedanta philosophy by the celebrated aphorism, Tatvamasi. Thou art that. Now, what he does, and this is his genius, he says, through any of these yogas, you can attain the highest goal. And there's no higher and lower. It's not that one yoga is higher than the others or, or leads somehow more directly to the same goal. So, just imagine, he sets up in New York and he called it the Vedanta Society of New York in an area called beautiful Herald Square, which at that time was a poorer area. It was a black area. It was like Harlem. And he set up there because he couldn't get housing anywhere else. He and this Jewish man he worked with called Leon Landsberg took an apartment there and started doing classes in the apartment. Can you imagine? And that was the first yoga classes in America, was in this apartment in downtown Manhattan near Broadway. Quite amazing. And then, not only that, but he would be teaching these ideas and how to practice yoga. In fact, the first book he wrote was the interpretation of the Patanjali Yoga Sutras called Raja Yoga. That was the, so if you ever get going to read the first book that he wrote, it was called Raja Yoga. You must read that. The second book he wrote was Bhakti Yoga. And then he wrote Karma Yoga and later Gyan Yoga was written by other monks. Now, just imagine that what was he teaching? He was teaching that you have to choose freedom. You have to be your own guru. You have to wake up. You are responsible for waking up. You can have a teacher, you can have a guide, but you have to wake up and you have to wake up to your true nature as a divine being. The Atma is that Brahman, Tatvam Asi. He was teaching this and he said, there is a practical way of doing it just by practicing yoga. And this was the great teaching that revolutionized America at that time. Everybody started talking about it and doing it. Nobody had said all this stuff before. People had read the Bhagavad Gita. People had read other things. They'd done theosophical, mystical things. But nobody had applied yoga and Vedanta in this way. And this was the unique thing that he offered. Let's see a couple more things. So he, he explains the yoga idea. These are his own words. Yoga is controlling the senses, will and mind. The benefit of its study is that we learn to control instead of being controlled. All the powers in the universe are already ours. It is we who have put our hands before our eyes and cry that it is dark. The moment I have realized God sitting in the temple of every human body, the moment I stand in reverence before every human being and see God in him, that moment, I'm free from bondage. Everything that binds vanishes and I am free. The whole secret of existence is to have no fear. Never fear what will become of you. Depend on no one. Only the moment you reject all help are you freed. He spoke of ultimate freedom and being true to oneself. The moment I have realized God sitting in the temple of every human body, the moment I stand in reverence before every human being and see God in him, that moment, I'm free from bondage. 
Everything that binds vanishes and I am free. So, just imagine he is preaching a message. He told Americans, you are not sinners. You are all divine beings, a spark of divine in every single one of us. He told Americans that there is a path to freedom from suffering, from doubt, from fear, total freedom that you can do on your own. That means he was saying, you can be your own teacher. You have to wake up the inner guru. Yes, you can devote yourself to an Ishta Devata or a guru like Ramakrishna. But then you have to make the get up and be awake and arise and awake and go and do it. So he was telling you that yoga, that all of you practice, was the way to that freedom. This is Swami Vivekananda's message. And the freedom was that message of Advaita, which is that you are the divine source of everything in this universe. You have just clouded it and covered it with Mahamaya and forgotten. And once you clear that, you're clear. You become free. This is the promise he made. And then when he came back to India, he saw that he realized and he raised money and his mission was to raise money in America and bring it and do a projects in India. And he came back and he started the Ramakrishna mission. And at that time, when most monastics were doing sadhana and other things, he came back and he told his 12 other brother monks that, look, we have to do practical Vedanta. We have to serve the poor. We have to look after and feed. We cannot give people Vedanta until we feed their bellies. This was the message. So I want to show you a clip with Swami Ve uh, uh, Sarvadevananda about the service part of what they, they developed. Karma Yoga Extreme. When he got back to his fellow monks, he had a new message for them. The Ramakrishna mission was not just for seeking enlightenment, it was to serve God through every human being. Atmano Mukshartam Jagat Hitayo Cha for the liberation of one's own self and also for the good of the world. Swami Vivekananda said that each soul is potentially divine. Goal is to manifest this divinity within. So this ideal of Swamiji actually inspired our whole life and we are still struggling every day to do the best we can. But the real surprise... So, just imagine. Can you imagine being both a yogi and a practical Vedantin? That's the promise of this path of Swami Vivekananda. So, he today, if you look at the Ramakrishna mission and you look at the Vedanta societies of America, there are 21 major centers here, here, the Vedanta societies are teaching Vedanta and yoga and discussing and educating people. And they've educated so many amazing people. Aldous Huxley, J.D. Salinger, Joseph Campbell, today all, so many artists and all. Now, on the other side, Ramakrishna Mission, one of the most active organizations in well-being, in welfare, in disaster relief, in education, in universities, in healthcare, in all these areas. So he, what his dream was to create upright, strong men and women in India. And he said that was the path to liberation. He never preached freedom fighting against the British. He never did. But he told them he never blamed anybody. He didn't blame the Muslims. He didn't blame the British. He said, you have to awake, become awake. Only by doing that will you be free. What a great message that was, no? So I think I'll stop here and I hope you see the film and you enjoy it. Mm -hmm.